So it's, it's 945, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, today's class is on the Synergy platform architecture. And just to tell you a little bit about me, uh, my name is Steven Dabrasovic. I'm the senior manager of the product marketing team uh, with responsibilities for RL78, RX, Synergy, and then the RZ microprocessors, the RZ A1 and the RZ G1. Um, so my team manages those products in the Americas region. Uh, before Renaissance, I've had a variety of design and design management and product management roles at NXP and ARM and Freescale. Renaissance has a lot of products in our portfolio. We have uh, three categories listed here, and you're going to see this slide in all of the um, presentations you attend. Devices, when you see devices, what we're talking about here is RL78, we're talking about RX, we're talking about those microcontroller devices, which, by the way, have very strong roadmaps, and if you go to the roadmap presentation, you'll see the roadmap for those devices. Solutions, what we're talking about with solutions are things like motor control solutions, or maybe partnered solutions, like we have a RZ Express program, where we partnered with Express Logic to bring some software along with the RZA microprocessor. That's a partnered solution. Synergy. Synergy is a platform. And Ali talked a bit about um, what a platform is and what we mean by a platform for Synergy in his keynote. And um, the rest of this talk is going to be to go through that. So why this presentation? Uh, the first thing is, is there anybody in their projects who's concerned about complexity? few people. Maybe some people don't want to raise their hand. But 32-bit microcontrollers have actually gotten very complex. Um, software requirements for our designs has also gotten very complex. And so complexity could very well be a concern that a lot of developers have today. Uh, and with all that complexity, we still see tremendous pressure in our competitive markets for deadlines. You probably have more aggressive deadlines now than you've ever had in your career. And uh, that could be a concern that you have in your mind. Risk. This is project risk. So the various components that you're using in your project, you know, are, they going, are you going to be able to get them? Are you going to be able to source them? Are they going to work as advertised? Um, there are some risks associated with that, and that may be a concern that you have in your mind. Budgets, being able to meet your project budget in terms of the number of man hours you're putting into it, because time is money, and also the, what you're paying for each of the components you're acquiring for your project. Um, support, you're working with multiple vendors. What kind of support are you going to get from them? That could be a concern you have. And then finally, productivity. You do one project, you finish it, now you're moving on to the next project. Can you reuse some of what you did on project you know, A for project B now? In this presentation, we're going to talk about the benefits of platform-based development. Uh, specifically, we're going to go into the, the Renaissance Synergy platform, um, kind of take a look under the hood, and uh, see all of the various elements that are included in the platform. So the agenda is a four-part agenda for today. Uh, first, I'm going to spend just a couple minutes talking about today's embedded requirements, what's really required in today's market. Uh, then we'll spend the majority of the time going through the Synergy platform. And I'll say a few words about uh, embedded security. This has become an important topic. And then finally, we'll go through a little discussion with some examples about platform-based development. So designing for today's embedded requirements is actually Embedded systems have changed a lot in the last 15 years, say. You know, 15 years ago, we would have had a embedded system that looked like this, maybe. A uh, single function. It's uh, closed within the device. Maybe it's a microcontroller with a 20 megahertz clock, 64K of flash, a few serial communications, a uh, few interrupt sources, segment LCD display. This is the kind of systems we were talking about, say, 15 years ago. Today's embedded systems are connected. Uh, they have rich graphical touchscreens, they have Ethernet, they have wireless connectivity. Um, they're multifunction devices uh, that are connected. So now they're also vulnerable because they're connected outside of the box. And there are many interrupt sources. And what all of this boils down to in this connected embedded system in today is uh, a growing complexity with software. And in fact, if we look, software has had a major impact on projects. Um, if we look at the number of months it takes to complete a project, the trend is that it's taking longer and longer to complete projects. And correspondingly, if we look at the number of projects that are being delivered late, it's not surprising to find out more projects are being delivered late as well. UBM does a, 
um, tech market study of embedded developers each year. These are the results from 2014. If we look at the top system development concerns of embedded developers, meeting schedule was number one, um, followed by debug, testing integration, and code complexity. In that study, it also asked about top technology challenges. And um, the respondents to that study said, integration of new technology, again, code complexity, software tools, and RTOS as all being key technology challenges. And then when asked how the resources were split in their organizations, in their teams, 61% uh, of the resources are now spent on software, with 39% being spent on hardware. So that's a, a big shift in the last decade. Uh, you know, developers really want to be able to reduce their time to market. Uh, Ali showed this slide in the keynote. I'm going to show it again here. Traditional development starts with the hardware design, then the driver design, the middleware design, the RTOS integration, the Cloud Connect, finally now developing the application code that makes your product your project, product, and then doing the test. This cycle, um, when we talk to our customers, we hear that this can often take 18 months to do this entire cycle. Now, using an integrated platform, we're actually able to reduce that 18 months down to 12 months, save six months. And the way that we're able to do that is by taking all of this infrastructure code, or we'll call it essential um, building code, the driver software, the middleware design, the RTOS, put it into a pre-integrated platform, and then you can develop your application code on top of the platform. Um, so you can reduce your development time from 18 months down to 12 months, saving six months, or you can reclaim that six month savings and do a little innovation on top to differentiate your product from your competitor's product. Um, cost is another important consideration for embedded de developers today. And we're talking about cost, what we're really talking about is the total cost. So the total cost includes all of the dollars that you're paying out. Um, so for example, you're buying microcontrollers for your projects. That's an obvious visible upfront cost. Um, but it also includes the time spent because time is money, um, and some hidden costs that also involve some dollars. So for example, purchasing software, purchasing tools, it takes time to select who you want to go with, um, do some evaluation. That time, there's a cost associated with that. To acquire it, to actually buy the license rights, there's cost associated with that. Training to come up to speed on the um, tools and the software that you buy costs money. Uh, doing development also is time, which costs money. And then one that's really often overlooked is the integration and the optimization of all these various pieces into uh, your product um, can take a lot of time as well. Uh, the verification, the qualification, more time. Um, there's upgrades and updates, that's even more time. And then finally, support and maintenance. Um, if you want to have contracts in place where you can get the latest uh, versions of the software tools you buy, if you want to be able to have support, that costs hard dollars as well. So when we're talking about cost, we're talking about the total cost here. And another point is being able to get started quickly. So if we are considering starting a new uh, embedded development project, uh, we're starting here, the very first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna probably go out and look at the various vendors. Who are the software providers? Who are the tool providers? Who are the microcontroller providers that are available? Um, we'll do some competitive analysis of all of these options, try and figure out which one is the best for our project, um, then we'll take the steps to acquire, means make the relationships with those vendors, negotiate the contracts, make sure we understand the licensing rights, bring the technology in-house and do an assessment to make sure that it's working as advertised, as you expected. Uh, sometimes there's some unexpected porting that you have to do when you're acquiring these software and tools. There's probably a learning curve if you haven't used them before. Um, some testing to make sure it works. Now you've established this platform um, and you can actually then assemble your project team to go and develop your product. Um, and then when you're done with developing that product, you have to start all over again, right? So it would be better if you could start here <laughs> instead of over here. <laughs> so that's a lower barrier to entry. Um, it gives you a big jump start on being, by leveraging the platform. Now IoT, anybody heard of IoT? <laughs> anybody doing IoT? Yeah, okay. So IoT is certainly a mega trend, no question about it. Everybody's talking about it. Maybe everybody's arguing about the exact value that's created in the numbers, but everybody knows it's here to stay. If we look at the requirements for IoT, uh, connectivity is an obvious one. Now when you're connected, what happens? You become vulnerable. 
So now security is a must have. This isn't a nice to have anymore. Um, we're moving from these uh, simple sing single function applications to these multi-function applications in the IoT era, and that requires an RTOS to manage all that software. Um, high integration, what this means is not only the connectivity integrated, but also you need to have all of your analog peripherals, for example, all of that integrated into the platform. Everybody wants a touch screen on their product today, even toasters, whatever. Um, they just get used to it. And maybe you're being asked to put a touch screen on your project um, as well. So HMI is an important consideration. And power consumption. A lot of these um, products in the IoT era use batteries. And uh, so power consumption is obviously important there. But even if it's plugged into a wall, with environmental concerns, there's, um, there are power budgets that are established. And so even then, power becomes important. And finally, scalability. Um, you know, nobody has time to develop something once and then not be able to reuse it. So fortunately, IoT just got a little simpler with the Synergy platform. And if we look at the Synergy platform, it has five elements associated with it. There is the, the Synergy software, and we're going to talk about it. The Synergy microcontrollers, Synergy tools and kits, the Synergy solutions. And we're going to talk a little bit about what makes a solution different from a kit because um, there are some important differences, and the gallery. So we're going to go through all of that. Now, as we go through that, keep in mind our uh, aim, our goal, when we were developing this platform was th three core values. One, we wanted the platform to deliver faster time to market. We wanted the platform to reduce the total cost of ownership, and we wanted the platform to lower the barriers of entry. So in all five of these elements, um, you'll see uh, evidence of these values being represented. Now, the software. The software is the first of the five elements. Um, the Synergy software package, or what we call the SSP. You'll hear people talk about the SSP. What they're talking about is the Synergy software package. This comes from Renaissance, by the way. This is a Renaissance product. And um, it's qualified by Renaissance. It is guaranteed for operation by Renaissance. Um, we do license uh, Express Logic software, and you'll see that as part of the block diagram. But the SSP, as a package, comes from Renaissance. It is a complete package. It's fully integrated. It's uh, maintained by Renaissance. We'll talk more about that. And what it really enables is being able to write software at the API level. And, and why does that matter? Why, why do we care about writing software at the API level? Well, there's, generically, there's at least two key benefits there. Um, one is that you abstract all of the lower level details, so you don't have to worry about that. That enables you to kind of develop faster. But then also, the second key benefit is that once you develop code using APIs for one project, you can very easily migrate to another project, even if you're changing underlying hardware. Um, the APIs don't change. Microcontrollers. This is the second of the five elements. And here we are using ARM Cortex microcontrollers in our Synergy platform. Um, we'll talk more about it, but it's the Cortex M0 Plus at the low end and the Cortex M4 at the high end. There are many great features about the microcontrollers in Synergy. Actually, in fact, I don't know, is anybody using RX? RX is an awesome microcontroller, awesome peripherals. A lot of those peripherals are used on Synergy. A lot of those peripherals have been enhanced on Synergy. We've added new peripherals to Synergy. Um, so you get all of those benefits. And there are many other benefits about the microcontrollers, but two really stand out, and Ali talked about them in the keynote. One is the scalability. There's, um, scalability doesn't come for free. Scalability takes extra development time to make sure that you've thought out for the future. Um, it actually takes extra die area on the chip itself, so there's a cost associated with that as well. We felt like it was very important to have scalability built into the platform, so we made those investments. So that's one standout area. The other standout area. The question is, can we use the Synergy software package, the SSP, with other microcontrollers like the RX? And the answer is no, not today. It is uh, part of the platform with the Synergy microcontrollers. So the second standout feature in the microcontrollers is the security. And we're going to go through and talk about what features uh, for security are present. The third of the five elements is the tools and the kits. Um, everybody has heard of an IDE, uh, Integrated Development Environment. We call uh, the Synergy Development Environment ISDE, Integrated Solution Development Environment, and we'll talk about that. There are design kits, there are starter kits. Everybody should have gotten an S7 starter kit here today. And then there are solutions, and there are two types of solutions. Um, there's a product example. A product example is actually taking a Synergy microcontroller software and building something that's custom hardware that looks like an end product. 
Um, along with that comes a design journey document that describes all of the design trade-offs that our engineers went through when developing this design instance, we'll call. You can take that design instance and very easily tweak it to create a similar product. Um, so that's a product example. It's very different than uh, a kit. An application example is taking one of the kits, the starter kit or the design kit, taking some sample code and an application note that goes along with it. That's what we call an application example. Now the gallery. The gallery is the fifth of the five elements. Um, the gallery is live now. You can go and create an account there. If you do, what you, can, what you will find is you can download all the software, the, the tools. You can download the licenses, the evaluation license, the production license, um, all from the gallery itself. And then as Ali was mentioning in the keynote, there's some very exciting future growth plan for the gallery to enable anyone to write an app that will run on the Synergy platform and sell it in the gallery. The Synergy software, here we're looking generically at the three pieces, the, the SSP on the left-hand side, and then the add-ons, uh, the QSA and the VSA. Now, if we look at the SSP, the SSP has pre-integrated into it the ThreadX RTOS. Uh, it also has the ExpressLogic Xware, so the, the TCP IP, the USB, the file system, the graphics, all completely optimized and integrated for the Synergy package. Uh, there is the BSP, so board support package available, um, customized for every Synergy hardware kit, and the hardware abstraction layer as well, um, you know, efficient drivers for all of the peripherals in Synergy. This application framework is a um, very interesting software structure. What it is, is it's a, a system level services that link the RTOS to the hall layer. And um, so specifically if you're doing audio playback or power management, there are application frameworks that make it very easy to, um, to do that. And we're going to go through one as an example. And functional libraries, there's functional libraries for DSP, there's functional libraries for security, and then the APIs themselves at the, the top level. Um, this again is really enabling to uh, abstraction of the lower level details and being able to very easily migrate code from one project to another project. Right. So the question is, for the ThreadX as part of the SSP, and I'm going to extend the question to the rest of the Xware components as well, all this ExpressLogic software, is there a license fee for you associated with that with the Synergy software package? And the answer is no. So you buy the microcontrollers, you get the entire SSP for free uh, from Renaissance, and uh, the license uh, that you actually get granted is in the galleries. So when you go into your Synergy gallery, you can download the evaluation license, the SSP, and you can download the production license. Yes? Uh, can you substitute some of these components? So if I wanted to substitute FedEx with, say, another OS, uh, can you do that? Right. So the question is, can you substitute the, the RTOS? We have the ExpressLogic RTOS in here with ThreadX with other um, RTOSs that are commercially available, and, and the answer is no, you cannot. So the um, ExpressLogic ThreadX is pre-integrated into the SSP, and it's the one that's available. Yeah, we have a lot of great partners, and um, we certainly work with them in, with other devices. Um, so, for example, we work with ExpressLogic also on the RZ. Yeah. We work with QNX on some of the automotive products. But specifically, when it comes to the Synergy platform, um, this is the software that is available. The question? We're going to talk about that, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, briefly, the, um, this component over here, these add-ons, this is software that we felt we had to make a decision. What do we put in the SSP as part of the standard software package? And what do we leave as room for add-ons? Um, Bluetooth stacks fell into the add-ons. Yes? No, so the, the BSPs that we provide are for our kits. Um, you do, you can, you have access to the full source code for the BSP, and so you can customize it for your own hardware. Um, the Synergy uh, software package block diagram with a few more details here. The hall drivers, so the Ethernet Mac, the CAN, um, graphics LCD controller, 
the ThreadX RTOS, the FileX, the USBX, the GUIX, and the GUIX Studio also comes included. And uh, NetX if you're doing IPv4, NetX Duo if you're doing IPv6. There's the uh, application frameworks, and there are 13 frameworks available today, uh, but we're going to be expanding that as we move forward and adding many more. And the functional libraries, like with security and DSP, this is the SSP uh, package. Um, and we're going to take next a look at the, uh, the audio framework, just so you have an idea of what a framework is. So an audio framework, what can you do with it is the first question. And you can, what you can do is you can play back audio files. You, you have some control features, so you can start, you can stop, pause, resume, you can do volume control. Now, the, now how you do it is uh, through APIs. So here are three APIs, the data get, the decode, the convert. Um, the lower level MCU peripherals that are involved in this uh, application framework for audio is the USB, the timers, uh, the sample rate converter, the DAC, the SSI. The SSI is a serial sound um, interface and it is I squared S compatible, uh, and PWMs. So in the middle is the SSP. And uh, here we see the FileX, the ThreadX, the USBX, the BSP, the Hall, and the audio application framework linking it all together so that it abstracts that from the APIs and you're just making API calls. So the other frameworks work similarly, just wanted to give you one as an example. Yes? Yes, so, you know, I've got I script being in a spike, and mm -hmm. so can we take several of these APIs and throw them all into one project? So I need audio and I squared C and SPI to just drag and drop those into my project? Yeah, absolutely, it all works together. Uh, sorry, the question was, can you take, I have to repeat the question because of the recording, uh, can you take software for different peripherals with the APIs and use them together without conflict? And the answer is yes. So what does qualified mean? Um, anybody, if, so I said the SSP, it's a Renaissance software product, and Renaissance qualifies it and guarantees it. What does qualified mean to you in this sense? Anybody want to win a candy bar <laughs> and make a guess? How would you qualify software? What would be some important things, some elements? You don't have to give a full answer, just a little tidbit. Yes? It will work. Sorry? It will work. It will work. So a guarantee, I, I will, that will earn you a starburst <laughs> candy bar. You have to guarantee it, yes. You have to provide a guarantee. What else is involved with qualifying software? OK, I heard, I heard who, who said meets all the requirements? You did? Yeah. Okay. I'll give you a t-shirt. How about that? <laughs> That's true. It has to meet all the requirements. And interoperability? Somebody said interoperability? I'll give this uh, man some, some M&Ms here. <laughs> You're absolutely right. You have to have interoperability. And it does link to the question that was asked previously. Sorry? Not break your API. Yes. Yeah, so that's kind of along the lines of interoperability. Exactly. Right. So you also have to holistically make sure that your product is secure as well. Okay. Now, specifically, there are, there, when I think of quality for the SSP, I think about four things here. <coughs> One is we have to treat it like a product, and we do. So there has to be a life cycle, a software uh, development life cycle. And we have a document, a Renaissance document, that describes the software development life cycle for Synergy software. Um, there's coding standards, design descriptions, code reviews, continuous integration and a formal release process as well. So we treat this like a product. Second most important thing is that there has to be a data sheet. If we're going to qualify something, we have to qualify it against what we're specking. So the data sheet, it's published on the Renaissance website. It has all the specs, the performance metrics, the benchmarks, the code size, context switch times, all of that. And it is the basis of the warranty. So if, uh, if a warranty claim is made, it is the SSP data sheet how it's performing on a Renaissance kit, that's what determines, that's what we're guaranteeing, is that the SSP will work per data sheet on a Renaissance kit. Now, we also follow industry standards. You know, there, there are some important industry standards that are helpful in software development. MISRA, IEEE, CERT. Um, we provide testing artifacts to enable product level certifications for like TUV or UL. And then the fourth piece is software quality assurance, uh, SQA. 
And here we have a quality assurance plan. It's a, it's a documented process, uh, test plans, test suites, test reports, and we make that uh, visible to you so you can see what we're doing to qualify the software. These are the four elements where we're saying qualified. Yes? Diagnostics. Ah, okay. Um, there, Rupesh, did you want to comment at all on diagnostics built into the MCUs? So the diagnostics will be provided separately. They're not uh, built in as part of our BSP, but that's something that the QA team will be adding. And there's a power on, power on self test that will be added on. It's not available right now. Thank you. Now. The SSP, we have a roadmap for it, and I just wanted to give you some insight into how we do versioning control here. So today, we have launched version 1.0.0 of the SSP. This is a major release. Uh, let's say next week we find a bug. You know, no software is perfect. We're, we're, we're not gonna go through a full quality release and delay a re, um, releasing a bug fix. We're just gonna do a hot release and um, make that available. Now, if we find another bug, it'd be 1.0.2. Um, about every six months, we do a minor release. Now, a minor release rolls in all of the bug fixes and goes through the full quality process. So SSP 1.1.0 would be the first minor release. We do those minor releases about every six months. Here are the rest of the releases kind of planned out, uh, minor releases every six months. Then every, say, year and a half to two years, we'll be doing another major release of the SSP. So SSP 2.0.0 and it'll have bug fixes and minor releases associated with it. Now, when we have two major releases in, uh, in parallel here, we actually will support them both as products. Um, what that means is that if you're using the 1.0 release, we'll still issue bug fixes and updates on the 1.0 release as well. Yeah, no, the, the release will be, so we have to control everything, and the release would be through the bug fix release, so it would have, it'd be assigned a new version number, and it'd be a full release with the, with the patch in it. So then would the customer have to back out that product or release? Say it's a new release that has a bug in it. Do they have to back out to the previous release until that bug is fixed? Do they have so to. How do they get around that bug that maybe is introduced in? Oh, no, no, I'm saying if, if, let's say you use this one, and it's got a bug, right? Bug. Now we release this one, it fixes the bug, you use this version. But it's six months before you get that. Well, no, no, this would be made available. If we find this first bug next week, we'll make this available next week. Okay. And then in week two, if we find this, we'll make this available in week two. This release is when we do the full QA and roll in all of these bug fixes. Oh, I see. Together. Yeah, we haven't defined it out like for a 10-year period or anything like that. Um, I mean, our, our intention is to do what makes sense for our customers. So at some point, we'll probably have a formal definition on that, but we don't have that today. What was the question for the recording? Uh, the question was, how long will we support uh, these older products? So here I was mentioning we have a 1.0 release here for this product, a 2.0 here, and these are being supported in parallel. How long would this one then still be supported? And um, what makes sense? We haven't defined it yet. Okay, I can take one more question on this section, and then I have to move on because we got a lot of material. Please. So just to clarify, when you when you get to three uh, and now you're supporting two dot and three dot are you do you maintain version one but don't do any improvements, or is it what happens at that point? Yeah, so it, this it kind of it falls into the same category. We haven't thought that far out because we're talking about major releases every two years, so that would be like six years from now. Um, at some point, we will, and we'll, we'll release some information on that. Is the major releases are backward compatible? Yes, the major releases are backward compatible. I, I apologize if there's more questions on this. There are other sessions on software, and you can please ask your questions there as well, but I want to make sure we get through the rest of this material. Um, 
QSAs, Qualified Software Add-ons. So looking at the full software package again, we have the SSP here and then these add-ons. So if we focus on the Qualified Software Add-ons, the QSAs, this is software that's coming from Renaissance and it's actually not free. So this we charge for, um, and, uh, but, but we also have the same quality guarantee on this software that we provide with the SSP. So this kind of software would be you know, specialized connectivity stacks, specialized security software, specialized control algorithms, that kind of software, stamped, qualified by Renaissance. Verified software add-ons are this last block over here. Uh, this is software that is provided by third parties, and it's also not free. They charge for it. So that's something you work out as a customer directly with a third party. But you have the knowledge that Renaissance has verified and qualified this software for you. Um, verified meaning the interoperability and that the quality of that VSA software meets our requirements as well. So we take the software, we make sure it meets quality requirements and is interoperable. Yes? Will it provide some kind of app store for these components? Yes. So the, yes, the question was, will we provide an app store for these VSA components? And the answer is yes in the gallery. It, it's totally up to them, however they, however they want to do it. What we do is we make sure that they uh, meet our quality standards. We have a document, a VSA quality document. We check it against that, and then we check for interoperability with the SSP. Yes? So as a follow-up to the uh, App Store question with the QSAs, what's the purchasing model for those components? Is it a royalty-based thing or a one-time purchase, or does it depend on what you're buying? For, for the QSAs, it will probably be mostly a license fee, an upfront license fee. I don't think we have any QSAs where we've contemplated a royalty. For VSAs, it's up to the third party, however they want to charge. Question? Do you have a list of what the QSA add-ons are? I mean, you know, what do you expect? You know, the packages that run broadly or if you mentioned Bluetooth, what else is on there as far as the QSA add-ons? Right. So for QSAs, it'll be things like the Bluetooth, the specialized connectivity, stacks. Um, for VSAs, embedded Java, uh, Bluetooth, industrial Ethernet, these are the kind of security, SSL, these are the kind of things that will be available in the um, VSA program. We'll take one more question on this section, this gentleman over here. So the TLS library is not part of the SSP? That's correct, it's not. The TSL library, the question was, is the TSL library part of the SSP? And it's not. It's a, um, a VSA component. So these are stamped, verified by Renaissance. And um, Ali showed this multi-layer access. I'm going to go through this quickly here. Uh, here we have the network thread that's making a top-level API call directly into the Xware components, the audio thread making a call into the audio framework, a display thread making the call into the LCD driver, um, at the hall level, and then we have a control thread making a call into a custom driver. You can write your own custom drivers. And a motor thread, um, you know, in motor control, real-time uh, performance is very important, so you can make, uh, you can actually directly touch the registers uh, with this motor thread uh, for motor control applications. Okay, so we talked about software. That's the first of the five elements. Now we're going to move into the microcontrollers. And we have four series in Synergy. The first one is the S1. Uh, the way that the series are defined is by frequency. The way the series are defined is by frequency. That's the key criteria. So anything up to 32 megahertz is an S1. Okay. This specific instance over here, S124, this is called a group. And this group has uh, 32 megahertz performance, 128 KB of flash, and uses Cortex M0+. This is a group within the S1 series. The S3 series is anything from 32 megahertz up to 100 megahertz. Um, the first group member of the S3 is S3A7, and this is Cortex M4, 48 megahertz, 1 meg of flash. S5 is anything from 100 megahertz to 200 megahertz, and S7 is anything from 200 megahertz to 300 megahertz. So, for example, this S7G2 group uh, within the S7 series is 240 megahertz, 4 meg of flash, Cortex M4. Uh, the S7 and the S5 uh, series are built in a 40 nanometer embedded flash process. Uh, voltage range is 2.7 volts to 3.6 volts. 
And the S3 and the S1 is built in 130 nanometer low power process and the voltage range there is 1.6 to 5.5 volts. They, all of the Synergy devices support the minus 40 to plus 105C uh, temperature range. If we look at the flash uh, density versus the pin count, the S1 is available in 36, 48, and 64 pin packages up to 128K of flash. S3 goes up to one mega flash and 176 pins. S5, two mega flash, and S7, four mega flash and 224 pins. And these are uh, peripheral and pin compatible across and between uh, the series. So for example, if we look at a 100 pin QFP package, if we were to compare the pin out for the S7 and the S3, they're drop in replacement. Um, also true for all the rest of the packages. If you look at 144 pin, they're all drop in replacement. Now what about if you're going from 100 pin to 144 pin? <laughs> Obviously you can't have drop in replacement, you got more pins. But uh, Synergy has a, a scalable pin out. Now when I was talking about the amount of time that was put into making sure we have scalability, you're going to see part of that here. This shows a bird's eye view of all pinouts for many Synergy packages. Not all of them. The ones in purple here are some of the initial packages that are being released today. Uh, 36 pins, 48 pins, 64, 100, 121, and 144. Um, if we were to look at a blow up view of this left hand side, we can see that the power pins, the ground pins, the functionality of the pin mapping, it all lays out nicely so that as you go from 100 pin to 144 pin, the amount of rework is minimized. That's the point of the scalability of the pin out here. Question? What are PGAs? Ah, so, <laughs> yeah, so this, this, was, this was for a QFP package, but it's a similar idea for the other packages as well. You know, where, where possible, we lay out the power, the ground, the functionality, so that you're minimizing rework. Obviously, if you go from a QFP to a BGA, that's, you know, <laughs> that's going to be more work. Between BGAs, there's less work. Uh, now, Synergy also has scalable um, peripherals in the sense that if we look at an S7 real-time clock RTC implementation here, we can see it's got the alarm function, interrupt controller, time capture, calendar count, clock divider, and bus interface in this block diagram. If we look at an S1, it is a subset, it's a pure subset, meaning that it's a reduced alarm function, so it's not the full alarm function, and it doesn't have the time capture unit. So it's, it's a subset of the S7, it's a lower end device. If we look at the registers, um, there are no dependencies. So you can see the gray, grayed out registers in the S1 where the functionality is not present, um, but also notice that the addresses haven't changed. They stay constant when you're going from one to the other. So this means that you can um, scale and uh, write code for one and be able to use it in the other. Now we're going to go through each of the block diagrams for the Synergy microcontroller, starting with the S7. It's a 240 megahertz uh, device, uses Cortex-M4 <coughs> core. It is 4 mega flash and uh, 64K of data flash. This is like EEPROM. It has 640K of uh, internal RAM. It has a security MPU. This is a very important enabler for many of the security features. It has, um, and, and this is not just the basic one that ARM has. This is an additional one that um, Renaissance put into these microcontrollers. It has also many security hardware features. We'll go through that as well. And uh, connectivity, very rich with connectivity, dual ethernet, USB, you name it. And HMI, it's got a, a graphics controller, LCD controller with a 2D drawing engine and JPEG codec. If we look at the S5 and think about how it compares the S7, it's a little lower frequency, 120 megahertz, a little less flash, two meg. Otherwise, it's fairly similar. Now the S3, the S3 is using a Cortex M4, this time in 130 nanometer process, so it's 48 megahertz, it has a different goal. Um, it is one mega flash, has 192K of SRAM, 16K of that data flash, which is like EEPROM. It has some really cool analog features, 14-bit analog to digital converter, 12-bit DAC. It has four op amps. It has 32-bit uh, timers, even on this lower end device. It has, of course, the higher end devices also have it. It has a segment LCD controller. 
It has the, um, the SSI, the serial sound interface for the I2S that I was talking about. Even on this low-end device, it has two channels of that. So you can do audio with the S3. It has a DMA controller, a DTC controller, an event link controller, and all of these really help offload the CPU so you can actually do more performance with this device. And it has still security. All of the devices have security. S1. S1 is a 32 megahertz device. It is uh, 128K of flash. It has the, the same analog 14-bit ADC, 12-bit DAC. It's got a cap touch uh, module in it. And it has a serial communication interface, the SCI. Does anybody know what the SCI is? Talk, I mean, you used of them, yeah. All right. What can you do with the SCI? What makes it special? Would you rather have a Snickers or a T-shirt? Uh, All right. He's right. So the, S, um, the SCI is the serial communication interface, and you can configure it for I squared C or UART or SPI. It's configurable. So although S1 has two channels of SPI here, two channels of I squared C here, you can make these three channels anything you want. So if you wanted to have five channels of SPI, make these three SPI. You got these two SPI. You got five channels of SPI. That's, that's what the SCI is. It also has the DTC and the event link controller, so again, just able to get more performance, and the capacitive touch um, unit we talked about. Now, if we move into the IDEs, uh, we have the E squared Studio uh, IDE, which we add in some solution-oriented components, and this makes it an ISDE for Synergy. We're gonna talk about that. If we look at the ISDE, it's Eclipse-based, and it has config tools, so config tools for pins, for interrupts, for clocks, for the SSP modules, all that is configurable in the ISDE. There's smart manuals for both the hardware and the software. Um, there's a debug uh, RTOS awareness built in. There's Sager J-Link uh, support built in. And you can compile with GNU compiler or IAR compiler. There is the ISDE plugins, and we're going to look at those next, the preparation, the build phase, and the uh, debug phase plugins. In the preparation phase, so you're getting started with a project. Uh, here you have your MCU project generator. You can make a board and device selection in the GUI here. You can make tool chain and debugger selections. In the pin, pin configurator, you can see the package view there. You can make pin selections. You can remap, rename the pins. You can check for conflicts. Um, in the clock configurator, you can set up all of your clock generations with the graphical interface. In the interrupt control config, um, configurator, you can enable, disable interrupts, assign priorities, all of that. SSP module configurator, you can create multiple RTOS threads, you can choose your modules, you can configure your module parameters, and then you press go in this preparation phase. And after you press go, all of the necessary uh, C code modules are inserted into the project. Uh, the header files, the C code, startup codes are generated, they're aligned, and then you can just start writing your code at main.c. That's the preparation phase. So the build phase, uh, it has support for um, your choice of GNU or IAR in the compiler. Uh, it has the smart manuals for the hardware and the software, so you don't have to go through you know, thousands of pages of PDF documents doing keyword searches. And it has uh, the ability to for the source code, you can access and view all the source code, um, even in the kernel aware debugging. And then uh, the smart manual, just an example of the smart manuals. This is a little snippet of code. You hover over the MCU register name, and it pops up some detailed information about that um, register. Same idea in the APIs. You hover over an API, and it pops up the detailed information about the API. So it's just a real convenient way of being able to access the information. Uh, saves you time. Debug phase. In the debug phase, there is um, debug integration for Sager J-Link. And then there's also uh, ThreadX RTOS awareness in here. So you can uh, dynamically track execution times for threads and interrupts and idles. Uh, you can have visibility into the threads and the queues and the semaphores. And with TraceX, you can have a graphical view of what's happening uh, in the system as well. All that's built into the debug phase of the ISDE. So these are plugins. Now, if we talk about the kits, there are three kinds of kits. Uh, there are promotion kits. Uh, these are typically free kits. They allow somebody to experience the Renaissance Synergy platform 
Maybe they have a USB, some pin access. Um, the starter kit, you have access to about 80% of the pins on the device. So not all of them, but most of them. Um, you can actually do quite a bit of evaluation using a starter kit. And it has uh, Arduino and PMOD expansion connectors on the starter kits. Then there are development kits, and the development kits are really appropriate for full project prototyping. Um, you have access to all the pins, lots of expansion. Um, if we uh, take a look now at the starter kit, because all of you should have an S7 starter kit. Um, every DevCon attendee received one of those. So you know, what can you do with your S7 starter kit? There's actually quite a bit that you can do with it. Uh, you can use eSquared Studio to, to rebuild the demo code to kind of get familiar with eSquared Studio. Uh, you can get familiar with the ThreadX and the GUIX Studio, which is a really cool tool to do graphics um, easily. You can set breakpoints, single step through the code, try some minor, minor modifications. Use it as a tool to understand the RTOS, threads, stacks, libraries, especially if you're new to RTOS. Um, understand the application frameworks. You know, I mentioned there were 13 available today. How you can leverage those, the audio, for example. Um, measure performance and memory size footprints. You can do that kind of analysis. Modify the demo code you know, to meet your needs and customize the graphics and connectivity. You can also use the connectors, the Arduino and the PMOD connectors, to add on other functionality. If you wanted a sensor, for example, you could add that on easily with a PMOD. Synergy solutions. So we talked about the, the kits. Now we're going to talk about the solutions. And I mentioned there were two kinds of solutions, product examples. Question. Uh, so for the IAR, you have two choices with a compiler, GNU, totally free. IAR, not free. <laughs> so that, yeah, you, have, you do have to pay for the IAR compiler. E Squared Studio, it's free. So if you use E Squared Studio and you use GNU, it's totally free. Sorry, there was somebody else raised their hand a little quicker back here. Um, will you be handling ThreadX updates or will ThreadX updates come directly from... Uh, the RTOS manufacturers and everything like that? Yeah, great question. And the answer is it comes from us. So we work with ThreadX. Um, any updates and functionality that we want to bring into the SSP, we do that. We release it through our SSP. And there was a question over here. So I am using, I'm using RL78 and probably I'm, I also want to use a Synergy. Do I need a two different version of eSquare Studio or a one version will work for both platforms? One, one version will work. So the question is on if you're using RL78 or RX or RZ with eSquared Studio and you want to use Synergy with eSquared Studio, um, same eSquared Studio. It's the plugins that you need for Synergy um, to make it enabled for that. We'll take one more question on this section back there. Is there a path available in E2 Studio to uh, not use Synergy for these kits? Like for the, M, or the S1, go in and just hit it with bare metal. A path to use E squared Studio. Without going through Synergy. Without using, without, so I mean, do you have to use the SSP? You don't have to use no. the SSP. Just like you get selections there when the first screen comes up for RX, RL, whatever. Is there a S7 or S1 available without going through the Synergy package? So I think for what, if you were using Synergy, you'd, you would want to download the eSquared Studio with the plugins from the gallery. Now, if you have already downloaded eSquared Studio in the past, I don't think that's going to work with Synergy. Did you want to comment, Bupesh, on? You have to select the Synergy product in the eSquared Studio. The option that you get is there's a BSP-only project. So you start with that. So you get the BSP. BSP is full source and you can change. Then you don't have to use the rest of the SSP if you don't want to. Thank you. <laughs> okay, one more question on this section, then for time we're going to have to move on. Oh, I see what you're saying. So let's say if you don't need to use USB, right. will the USB-X be loaded into your microcontroller? Is that your question? Yes. The answer is no. Does it, does it affect the product, you know, the cost of the product or not? No. So you, it does not affect the cost of the product. 
Now, if you buy a microcontroller, that's, you know, you, there are different prices on the different series of microcontrollers. Um, so that's there. But the SSP has all the functionality built into it, and there's no, there's no charge for the SSP. Now, if you're not using USB, the USB code will not be burned into the microcontroller. So you don't waste any memory for that. OK, I'm going to have to move on now. Sorry. Um, on the solutions, this is the fourth of the five elements. And they're product examples and application examples for each of the series. Product examples are custom hardware that is designed as a near in product, what we call a design instance. So for HMI, it's almost like an HMI product. For data acquisition, it's almost like a data acquisition product. Sensor network, um, smart sensor, almost like a, a, a product. Now, what you get with this uh, product example is a design journey document. And the design journey document describes all the trade-offs that the engineering teams at Renaissance have made when putting together this product. Um, so you get access to that. You can see our rationale, our logic. It's a great way to learn, or if you just wanted to see what trade-offs we were making. You also get the full eSquirt Studio project. You get the BOM. You get the schematics. You get the board layout files. Application examples, what they are is you're taking uh, one of the standard kits, uh, so the starter kit or the design kit, using some sample code and an application note, and you get the eSquirt Studio project with that as well. So for S7, we have an application example for cloud-connected um, systems, capacitive touch for S3, for example, industrial for S1. These are all application examples. And we'll see many, many more product examples and application examples. We're just at the beginning of the Synergy launch today. So we're going to take a little closer look at this HMI product example next. It looks like this. This is an actual picture of it. Uh, it represents one design instance of an HMI product. It is, um, includes the design journey document. It's a great starting point, especially if you're doing something that involves HMI. Um, you can really see the performance of the S7 graphics controller and the SSP graphics software if you look at one of these S, um, product examples. And the, the product example also comes with a demo. So it comes, this one comes with a thermostat demo. Um, so there's extensions on there for audio, uh, for alarm sounds, uh, for using PMODs. Um, all these extra extensions to control the backlight using an ambient uh, light sensor. All that comes with the product example. Now the gallery. The gallery is the fifth of the five elements. And um, you know, what happens if you want to get access to the gallery? It's live today. What you do is you go uh, to the website and you're going to need to create an account. Just fill in some basic information about yourself. And uh, once you're there, you can locate the SSP. You can locate the ISDE, you can locate the GUI X Studio, and you can download all of those for free. Um, use it on your S7 board. You can uh, browse the gallery to see what add-ons are available, the QSA components, the VSA components. All that you can do in the gallery. OK, so now we have a little shy of uh, 10 minutes left. We've got about eight minutes left. So we're going to talk a little <coughs> bit about embedded security. And uh, there are many important elements associated with embedded, embedded security. We have two detailed lectures on Synergy embedded security here this week. Um, Hayden Povey is giving those lectures. He's a great speaker, very knowledgeable. So I'm only going to show two slides on security here. This first one is when we talk about uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. This is the CIA of embedded security. And confidentiality means um, cryptography so that you have secure communications. It means secure authentication and identification. Integrity means establishing a root of trust, um, being able to isolate critical areas of code so you can restrict attacks, and uh, having a secure boot capability. And also, on the JTAG, you want to be able to control access to the JTAG because you don't want somebody coming in through the JTAG. Um, all that relates to the integrity. And then on the availability, again, you want to be able to isolate critical systems so that somebody can't shut down your product. Um, or if they do, that your product is failing safely or going into some safe mode. Um, you want to be able to monitor uh, your application to make sure it's running as expected with no surprises. And then when you have your product out in the field, you also want to do an update to the code in your product. And you want to do that update securely. So you want to be able to do secure firmware updates in the field. And Synergy does all of this. And how it does it is with a mix of hardware and software features. So these are the hardware features. These are the software features for each of the four Synergy devices. 
So for on the hardware side, we have um, cryptographic accelerators for symmetric and asymmetric hash accelerator, asymmetric key generator accelerator, um, key secure storage. Uh, this is what Ali was talking about in his keynote. Limited JTAG access, so being able to block that door. Um, the secure MPU, which is a, a very nice piece of IP from Renesas, and a uh, unique ID. On the software side, the last two rows, the cryptographic library and the secure vault, are part of the SSP. Uh, and then the TLS, the SSL, the IPsec, these are all um, VSA components. Okay, we have a question. Um, do you have a list of curve cryptography? I didn't see that in any of the platform examples. Do you know, Bupesh, offhand, if we have ECC? ECC is not part of the 1.0 release, but it will be in the future release. Thank you. Okay. So, so it's in, I'm talking about the hardware. So you're saying the hardware has it, but the firmware doesn't have it yet? Yes. Okay. Okay, so we just have uh, a couple slides left here to talk about um, platform-based development. And if we look at typical embedded development today, let's say we're developing a thermostat. Uh, if, we, if we go and we select a processor normally based on the features, um, go figure out some specific hardware modules to put around the processor, um, go find the code, um, do some testing with that code, um, develop some application software on top of that, and then, and then do some test. In this process, the focus is really on the development process itself. Okay, the focus is on the development process itself. What we really want to do with a platform-based approach, what it enables is a shift of focus. Okay, it enables a shift of focus away from the development process and to the in-customer's experience. How is the in-customer going to experience your product? Um, how will the customer use this thermostat? They probably want a touchscreen in it, for example. So you start to think about those kind of questions. How will this be used? What features can I add? And if you can leverage a platform, it's great because now maybe you remembered Synergy has this awesome HMI uh, product example. I can take that product example, leverage it as a starting place, and now I don't have to worry about any graphics stuff. I can just start there. Um, immediately I've added graphics to my thermostat. Uh, HMI connectivity, uh, we've seen all the connectivity code that's available with Synergy so you can just grab whatever you need with the platform. Um, spend more time developing your application software to enable those innovative new features you're going to add. And again, the shift really here is away from the development process and over to what is the customer, how are they going to use it? How can I innovate to provide a better customer experience? This is the real benefit of a platform, in my opinion. If we look at building autom automation as one example, an S1 in a wireless motion detector, it's got the small form factor, the low power, the good analog it can do. S1's great for wireless motion detectors. That same building automation company can use an S3 in a low-end security panel, an S5 in an economic security panel, and an S7 in a high-end security panel. So this same company is getting a lot of reuse as they um, cover their product space. Home appliances, same idea. S1 in an oven controls, if you're a company doing home appliances, S1 in oven controls, S3 in washing machines, S5 in coffee makers, S7 in smart refrigerators. A um, lot of increased productivity by being able to reuse what you've already used on previous projects. Now, maybe you're a company that is um, doing multiple S3 type implementations. So maybe you have one team that's doing water or, or flow meters, you have another team that's doing smart energy meters, another team that's doing data loggers, and they're all using S3. They can actually all help each other and increase productivity as well. Now, to summarize, what we've talked about today is embedded applications are multifunction and connected. Uh, software is a key challenge for product development. Uh, security is now a must-have. We're connected, we're vulnerable, we have to have security. Uh, Synergy is a pre-integrated platform. It contains the software, the micros, the tools, the kits, the solutions, and the gallery. And it really enables to, um, you to use all of this infrastructure code instead of developing it yourself and spend more time innovating. So if you're concerned about these things, you know that with a platform-based development, you can simplify development, meet deadlines, reduce risk, meet your project budgets, and improve your productivity. And we also looked at all of the synergy elements. In um, my last slide that I wanted to share is that this is really just the beginning for synergy. 
So you've seen the investment that Renaissance has made in this platform. You've seen Ali talk about it in the keynote. This is just the beginning. What you're going to see coming in months is more features will be added to the SSP, more capabilities added to the application framework, more product examples and applications added. We will have an expanding ecosystem of partners, you know, VSAs, many more VSAs being added to the gallery, and uh, the expansion of the gallery itself to include this App Store idea. We have one minute left, so if there are any last remaining questions. Yeah, so we do have um, a Bluetooth device in the RL78 product line called the G1D. Um, and you could, I believe it's just a serial connection that you would use from that device over to the Synergy microcontroller. So the stack would be running on the G1D itself. Okay. Question. Uh, uh, yes. ISD, it's, it's that you could do memory performance analysis, but uh, does this come with memory uh, leakage detection, for example, or memory monitoring? Within the ISD, does it come with memory leakage, leakage detection, detection or memory, or memory monitoring? monitoring? Yes. Rupesh, do you know? <laughs> uh, no, it says, I don't believe it does leakage detection. It, it gives you the information, but it doesn't automatically tag the memory leakage uh, detection as far as I understand. Okay, so the answer was it gives you the information but doesn't automatically flag. I'm sorry, but we're out of time. I will be here for the rest of the week, so. Um, you, you can't catch me now because I got another presentation, but find me later in the week and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Wow.